way. So good morning to, every, to everyone. Um, good morning. We seem to have a, a good audience this morning, so thank you for, and welcome. Uh, we will be recording this session and releasing it as an audio recording, just to let you know before anyone says anything too outrageous. Um, so um, again, we want a good debate, so good morning. Um, we're going to try and cover, I think, three key areas today. One is how do we build trust back into safe spaces? How do we actually make sure people feel comfortable coming back into hotels, into workplaces, um, into all kinds of hospitality environments? Um, how do we nurture the over 70s? Because arguably that's going to be an important market because uh, they've still got money to spend and actually it's important to get them engaged and yet they're the most vulnerable. So how do we make sure again we get that confidence and get people uh, happy to re-engage? And the final thing is one of the things we've found constantly that is a core for greater collaboration. So how do we actually make sure that actually does take place? How do we bring that together? And actually, what can we learn from the past um, to actually help us during this period of time? So I think there's some interesting uh, topics we're going to discuss with Bob today. Um, a warm welcome to Bob, uh, who's been a central figure for the industry over the last 30 years, former chief executive of the British Hospitality Association, as it was, and probably did as much as anyone's ever done in bringing the industry together um, during his tenure. Um, so I think, it, as always with Bob, he'll have some really interesting thought-provoking comments uh, to kick us off with. Okay, thanks, Chris. Can we all hear okay? Yes, Bob. What I, what I wanted to do this morning and have a brief five or ten minutes is, one is I'm, I'm trying to look to the positive, and I think we've all got to start being positive about the future, not, you know, what, you know, what are the problems, start looking at what can be done and how... We ourselves and industry collectively can find our way through the, the circumstances we find ourselves in because, quite frankly, the circumstances are changing on a daily basis. The guidance is changing. Government plans are changing. And also we're going to have regional and devolved issues as well. So I think it's the onus is on us to come up with solutions and the, the idea that only the government can find solutions, albeit they give guidance and advice, I think isn't the answer. So one is I want us to have that approach. Secondly, I'd like what we talk about today. These are really raising issues and discussion points because I think looking at firm solutions at this stage is difficult. And I'd like to explore really the whole of tourism, hospitality and leisure sector uh, because they are all, as it were, inter integrated and linked. Secondly, I think there are lessons that we should be learning from around the world, particularly across Europe, where they may be, to me, two or three weeks ahead of coming out of the lockdown. And... Uh, Without giving a plug, I'm delighted one of my clients, Procter & Gamble, have been sharing with me their cleaning experiences in the hospitality sector from across Europe. So that has uh, been an interesting perspective. But what I think we can all agree is life will be different in the future. The idea that we will go back to the way things were, I think, is, is, is a pipe dream. Life will be different. And my own view is that the key to all of this will be having a very innovative way of thinking. We've got to think new things, new ways, new solutions, because there will be customers and there will be guests and there will be business, but it will be different. And we've got to find innovative solutions and link to that, particularly for our sector, we will have to find ways of taking out fixed cost because the volumes may well not return to what we've been used to in the last five years. And we all know this sector is a relatively high fixed cost business. So the only way we're going to have profitable business in the future is how we take out fixed cost. And that may well be in simplifying menus less choice, different methods of production, central production units, um, local supply chains, 
um, less choice perhaps. So rather than having exotic fruits coming from around the world, local produce. So those are areas. But I would just like to raise what I think two or three core issues we're going to have to think about, which Chris related to. I think the biggest issue we are going to have to face for our sector is how do we build customer confidence? It's all very well places starting to reopen uh, in due course on a gradual basis. But if customers don't have confidence to come back, that is a big issue. Secondly, I think cleaning has a very large role to play. And I've been promoting the last two or three weeks a new standard of what I am COVID-19 approved standard of cleaning developed with cleaning companies and we're developing it with big groups of hotels to start with so that we can actually show customers that we have a new standard of cleaning called COVID-19 approved backed up by a comprehensive signage system and a demonstration of extra cleaning that I always saw when I was managing five-star hospitals. You would visibly see extra people going around in cleaning roles visible to patients and customers. So I want to see a much greater role and a visibility of cleaning to this new approved standard. The second area I want to raise is this over 70s group of people, one who are perhaps feeling the most vulnerable because of this COVID-19, but only if I speak to any restaurateur, country house hotel, particularly businesses outside London for our sector, the over 70s are the ones with the greatest disposable income and the ones that have actually made businesses profitable. And without those people in the immediate future, profitability would look a distant target. So we have to find ways of how can we grow confidence for that over 70s people that they feel reassured to come back. And maybe we actually have to sort of have our own scientific group, an advisory group for the sector coming out with specific scientific recommendations for the sector. I don't know. But we must focus on that over 70s group who are so important. And before I, just as I wrap up my comments, I just want to relate a little story to you and take some upside from this. When we were managing the crisis of foot and mouth, I had daily meetings with Alistair Campbell and from time to time with um, Tony Blair. And one comment they both made to me at the time was, if nothing else, this has made government understand the importance of tourism and hospitality because right across government, they are getting a daily briefing on how foot and mouth is affecting your industry. And I did notice the impact afterwards that government did understand the industry better. Now, this crisis we're going through is of a totally different order to foot and mouth, but I think it's going to have a similar impact right across government. They really now do understand the importance of tourism and hospitality and leisure to the economy. They understand it's the driver of jobs. It makes people feel better. It raises an enormous amount of revenue for the government. So I think down the track, we will actually have a much better relationship with government and it, it will help us in all the things that we want to do uh, to help this sector into the future. So I am optimistic that out of all this will come some benefit to the sector. So that wraps up my comments, Chris, as a starting point. Uh, that's lovely, Bob. Thank you. Can I just pose some questions before we start opening up to um, discussion? One of the things, that, one of the factors that comes through time and time again, it leads on your last point, is government is going to have to be much more supportive of industry um, as we come out of this. However, at the same time, the government's only got so much money in which you can support industry. Do you believe that actually we can develop the relationship that allows that to be achieved? 
My comment would be that uh, I've, I've always been nervous about claiming that our industry is a special industry and requires special attention because the response will always be from government. Every industry to an extent is important. And if you want money for your sector, you know, are you more important than education? Are you more important than health, etc.? What I would like to get into the government's mind is we're not a special case, but we are as important to the economy as the airline industry, as all other industries, so that we're not a special case. We are just a very important part of the modern British economy and the support and help we get should be given on that basis of how important we are to the economy. I think pleading special cases is tends not to be very fruitful, quite frankly, in in my government experience. I mean that's I mean that's the challenge, isn't it? It's how we find that right balance. Uh, and that is why I, uh, you probably I, I singularly was always against the campaign to reduce VAT because I knew the response from government that. Yes, we hear what you say, but arguing that you alone are a special case is really, really difficult. What I want to argue is what a critical part we are to the whole British economy and that we're key. We're a key industry component and we should be thought of when there's help being given to industry across the board. Oh, that's fair. Now, one of the um, again, the other core coming out of the moment is for greater collaboration. And arguably, the industry used to work far better together than it has done in recent years. How do you view this? Do you think the industry will come together, or how do we, what do we need to do to make sure that we really do work better together? I think uh, I have seen the first signs of it working better together in the last two or three months than perhaps it has done in the last five years. Um, one of the lessons I learned post foot and mouth was we had to work together as an industry to get out of foot and mouth. We had major marketing campaigns. The whole industry put money in the pot collectively and we worked together. Unfortunately, that togetherness lasted about six months and then everyone went their own individual ways. I'm hoping this has been such a hit to the culture that we will continue to work together collectively on the business issues, on collective social issues. You know, the example of the Ethical Chefs Association I thought was great. But if nothing else, this should teach us that as a sector, we are better all working together than little groups forming their own, their own dominions. I mean, I, I think, look, I think that's the general agreement. So it's actually how we achieve that. It's going to be the interesting, I think, discussion going forward. And, 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 and keep it, Chris. I think in the short term, the pressures are such that, I mean, I think to be fair, uh, Kate Nicholl at UK Hospitality has done a great job the last three or four months. The challenge will be to keep that focus and to reach out to right across the industry, not just the big corporates, but regional, rural businesses right across the sector and bring people together. Uh, and that takes genuine leadership and hard work. But I think we do have the opportunity to do that. No, I agree. Um, going back to some of your opening comments, you obviously have been working at Procter & Gamble and you said that noted there were quite a lot to learn from Europe. Yeah, no, I, I mean, oh, what you're yeah, looking, uh, seeing. Yeah, I mean, what is interesting is um, a, a, an enormous amount of good work actually has been done in France, I hate to say it, but I have to say the big corporates dived in very quickly to work with government to try and help them achieve uh, what was what was required. And I thought we were a little bit, some, you know, a little bit slower over here doing that. And even on a European basis, um, I know Procter & Gamble, as an example, is working with Horikawa, which is the sort of EU hotel group, 
to try and get this standard of cleanliness approved across all hotels, as an example. And those are the lessons I've learned there that um, corporations can play a role by getting involved with government at the highest level. And uh, even, even in America, uh, the corporates got on board very quickly, albeit with the Trump administration, but they are the government and they got on board quickly. I thought some of our chief executives of big companies were a little bit slow at getting on board of one, seeing what they could do to help government targets and communities, etc. There were a few notable exceptions in the early stages. I thought Best Western were excellent to start with offering their hotels and a few hotels in London. Uh, but I think corporates have a strong role to play in uh, helping government. Um, I'm, re I'm, I'm always reminded of the sort of the famous Ronald Reagan saying is, you know, don't wait for government to solve your problems. It's up to you really to get on and try and solve your problems. Government's there for guidance and advice and assistance. But it's industry and ourselves who are the doers and the ones who are actually going to find solutions and come up with the actions that are required. Uh, that's very fair. Uh, your forecast of how you see the recovery process, can I ask? I, I, I do actually see the recovery process actually starting probably this week, next week. But I think particularly for... Um, the UK as a whole, it's going to, I mean, everyone was saying six weeks ago, all the experts who I'm, you know, always a bit worried, wary of, were saying it was going to be like a steep V that we went into this sudden lockdown and we would come out of it really, relatively quickly. My own view, it's going to be a, slow, a long, slow um, coming out of this uh, recession, if we call it that, and it may well be into mid next year before we're out of it. So a very long, slow, gradual coming out of it, because I think it is about getting that confidence back with the consumer. Secondly, that for the next 12 months, we're probably going to be entirely reliant on a domestic market before you know the overseas market returns. And so it's going to be long, slow and steady would be my view, not what I term a sharp V. No, I think that's fair. You touched on local supply chains, uh, and there is a view that, uh, I think some research came out yesterday, that more and more people are eating, buying fresh produce. Than has well, that, that is great, but I mean, I think most companies are genuinely going to have to re-examine their menus, for example, and well, not just for food items, but for non-food items as well, how secure are those supply chains? Where are they buying from? You know, do we need to have, you know, sort of um, exotic fruits coming from a long distance, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it, it, will, cha it will change to an extent for the foreseeable future where we buy a lot of our food from. You know, we will be looking more local or near Europe uh, and that may well impact a lot of the business we do by re-examining that supply chain. And there will be, I suspect, um, some cost increases as a result of that. We may get some gains and some losses, but I think everyone should be examining where they buy their food, how secure it is, and if there are issues like this return in the future, how secure those supply chains are. There's obviously a lot of discussion about CPUs and how CPUs could really take off during this period of time, which is a lot. Well, I, 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 it, it was interesting. It seems a long time ago, when I was at university, I, I did a thesis on central production units because I was with the Ford Motor Company that developed the very first CPU in the country to feed 120 factory outlets for all its canteens. And that was all about in those days trying to get sort of um, 
take out labor, reduce cost, and have a consistent product. And it was very successful for a while, but eventually it fell out of favor because, in fact, there wasn't enough variety in choice, and the customers wanted more interest in the food. And that's why then ultimately, full circle, it went back to being produced on site. People wanted um, locally produced foods, the food, they wanted a, a daily choice, a much more variety, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe in this new world for the next year, 18 months, two years, uh, where we're trying to take out cost, um, less people being able to work in a kitchen, we are going to return to buying in where we can, where the standard is, is the right standard. And I think we will see CPUs reopened almost and redeveloped very quickly, perhaps for the next year, 18 months or so. That's really interesting. Um, customer confidence, just to touch on this one, because you've obviously made a big point that we need to regain customer confidence. I mean, how big a challenge I, I, do you think that is? I, I do think it is a very big challenge because, um, you know, if I look at the most extreme example at the moment, it is the use of, shall we say, public transport, you know, rail, tubes, buses, etc. It's all very well saying to people, go back to work if you can, but then you've got to use the tube in London. Uh, and it's interesting, the stats, even the last week or so, are showing that public transport usage is not actually increasing very much at the moment. You know, people are happy to get in using their, their car, their bike, whatever, but there's a real problem with public transport. I think if, if young, fit and healthy working people are nervous about using public transport, imagine how older people are going to be feeling about that. So I do think there is a big long-term job of building up this public confidence. So that's why I'm, I'm look, I, I really do feel that we've got to focus on, as I said, extra cleaning, COVID approved cleaning standards, uh, vis you know, greater visibility of cleaning staff, um, people using all the right cleaning materials, uh, staff being specially trained in new procedures. I think we've got to put cleaning to the fore as one of the first tasks to, to get this customer confidence up, that i.e. nothing is more important than cleaning. We've always said it in the past about food hygiene and cleanliness, but I think a lot of people have given lip service to it. Now I think it's going to be an absolute must cleaning is the most important thing in a very visible way. Uh, one question being posed in the chat, which is a fair one, is when you were at the DCMS, obviously the role was very much funded between industry and government. Yes. Is there a case to reinstate that? I absolutely think there is, but I think, uh, you know, I was very fortunate that, you know, say I, I held that role and it was half funded by government and half funded by industry. And it was essentially the 12, 15 biggest companies that paid the industry share, if I can put it in those terms. And, you know, whilst that may sound generous, I mean, that, that meant that, you know, the big companies were asked to pay about £5,000 a year. But quite frankly, I think the benefit they got by having direct access to government, I mean, the example being I had a weekly meeting with Chris Smith, who was the uh, Secretary of State at the time, on tourism and hospitality matters. So he was fully briefed. And when people argue, oh, we want a tourism minister doing this, that, and the other, I'm always a little bit suspect. What you actually want is a cabinet secretary of state fully briefed on the issues that he actually takes to cabinet because that's where the decisions are made. A tourism minister is nice to go around the country opening bazaars and cutting ribbons and waving the flag in seaside resorts. But when it comes to decisions being made, it's in cabinet and in cabinet committees, and it's the secretary of state. And that was the key role, which I think was so important at that time. 
and that we've lost in recent years. Uh, thank you. Let's open up to various comments, the whole group, um, to, get to make yeah. comments. Um, any opening questions? Michael, can I bring you in here? Because uh, I know that you are a great uh, advocate for collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. And thank you, Bob, um, for, for those great comments. There's, there's so much there. I don't quite know where to start. But um, first of all, collaboration, which is uh, very dear to my heart. I've always felt the hospitality industry, and particularly hotels, are tremendous at collaboration. I always felt that uh, the, uh, 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 competitors will, in fact, go to help a fellow competitor if they're in trouble. And um, I think we've demonstrated that through things like the various hotelier groups, the West One group in London, the East mm. One group. Um, I'm uh, particularly involved uh, with Marco, with uh, EMMA, the European Hotel Managers Association. Yep. And uh, there's 400 members there and they're all in communication via the, via the, uh, the, 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 the main secretariat to be sharing ideas. And, and to Bob's point, um, we've been very interested to see some of the plans coming, the, the um, uh, sanitation plans coming from overseas, Spain particularly, France you mentioned. Uh, governments have published their, their guidelines. As you say, Bob, they're not there to control, but I think the industry does need some guidelines in and, and what is good practice. And in Emma, um, that is you know, go, going on big time to try and uh, share. We're asking each other what's happening in your country, you know, what tips have you got? So, so, um, so uh, I, I agree that's very important and, and it's so essential that hospitality, who's, who've remained so strong during this, and I think have given so much to the community in, in uh, giving out foods and, you know, the, our, our, our very best hotels in London have opened themselves up, you know, to, to the NHS and the key mm. workers. And I think it's, it's such a great it, great example and totally agree that needs to continue forget the competition uh, we're all in one industry um, and competitors should be uh, not, not trying to sort of uh, gain a gain a stake for themselves but supporting the recovery um, of, of, uh, of, of, of the industry uh, that well said well said <laughs> yep yeah agree Michael and I I think that Albeit that we may be leaving the EU, we do need to find mechanisms to keep in touch with our colleagues in Europe because, you know, there's some great work being done by the, you know, the industry, whether it's hoteliers, restauranters or caterers across Europe. And we want to still be able to feed into those ideas. Yeah. And uh, let me tell you that Emma has not left the EU. By the way. Well, that's the point I'm making. And, but the one point I would add, it is absolutely fundamental that working together, particularly amongst the key companies, not just hoteliers, but restauranters and caterers, has to come from the top. We need the chief executives of all those key companies to be working together sensibly. And then it goes down the culture of the organization to get cooperation all the way down. If, if the guy at the top doesn't have that collective culture, shall we say, um, it's, you soon lose it. I was fortunate in my day of people like um, Colin Marshall, John Jarvis, David Michels, a whole range of very clever, bright people who were great champions of the industry, who put aside differences and came together when it mattered for the industry. I mean, that, I mean that's what we need to see again, isn't it? We that do. I mean, if I just say, for example, we, I, um, when we were coming out of foot and mouth, I went and had a meeting with Gordon Brown, and he said, yes, we need to run a campaign to promote that Britain is open again. He said, I will put in £15 million into the pot for a marketing campaign if you can raise £15 million from industry. I then, after that, went to the CEO of P&O, British Airways, BAA, uh, David Michels, and within a week, we had put together £15 million from the industry to match that funding. And our only condition was that industry should lead the marketing campaign, not visit Britain. And it worked exceptionally well by all those leaders having put money in and coming together. 
And I just wish that we had more of that sort of active cooperation, which we need now, not just on COVID-19 issues, but perhaps some wider issues for the industry as well. Well, I think that's my concern, because actually a lot of the great works we're talking about have been done by great units or great independents. Yeah. Um, had, a lot of people have commented on the lack of voice that has been from the corporates, and that's what we've got to see come back, I think. Well, that's the point I was trying to make, whereas I haven't seen that. I thought France, um, a, a core group, a number of big corporates in France came through very quickly, and I didn't see that from our sector in the early days, other than Best Western. I thought the guy from Best Western came through very quickly, and I really do applaud that. But it's it's all the the you know the guys at the top. That's what leadership is about, and they've got to be showing that you know that leadership. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, a completely different topic. Gary Gary Atkinson has made a very interesting point. Uh, Gary, can I bring you in here? Yes. Um, Talking about I, ScotRail and, and travel. Yes, ScotRail uh, are reporting um, their challenge going forward will be a moving of the workforce uh, and the need, as I said in the chat line, that the need to absolutely um, uh, move the peak times and spread them out. And, and um, Alex Hines, the MD, uh, there is a plea to industry to communicate this, uh, to, to, to expand on the working day. Because uh, as, as I said, me already capacity is low. Um, social distancing uh, will take a lot of the seats out of the carriages uh, currently, um, obviously, we know they're in they're, all the franchises are in emergency contracts rather than franchise contracts, um, and he doesn't see that ending anytime soon. Um, so it, it, it's a very interesting and and compelling um, stats when you start looking how just how are we going to get the workforce around uh, if the public transport just can't cope. Oh. <laughs> I think I think the the challenge is obvious. I think the solution is unclear. I think for any of us who are regular commuters, um, you know, already in the southeast, um, you know, rush hour starts at sort of six thirty and goes on till six thirty in the evening. It isn't like in the old days of you know rush hour just being you know seven thirty till nine o'clock, i.e. The amount of people in the past that were traveling to work was already almost over capacity. Um, I think the only solution for the foreseeable future will be, a yes, we're going to have to stagger people's working hours, uh, but two, the reality is a large number of people perhaps should stay working from home where they possibly can just to ease the public transport issues, quite frankly. And maybe that is going to be the long-term solution that, you know, we look at London, I think, you know, three or four million people a day commuting into London normally on a daily basis. Have we got a half of that, quite frankly, so that all those big offices in London do people need to be there five days a week? Maybe in future, only two days a week they go into the office and three days they can work from home. I think we will, for the foreseeable future, have to change our work patterns. That's scheduling hours, people, more, you know, people working from home where they possibly can, because I don't think uh, we are going to be able to move people on public transport in a safe way for the foreseeable future. I mean, it's a really interesting discussion point. This is how it's going to impact on city centers. I had a, a conversation with a lawyer yesterday who tells me that 71% is estimated of local uh, rural law firms will go bust over the next year, which is huge. Yeah. But actually also, uh, a number of American law companies in the city aren't allowing their people to go back until the end of the year at best. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying is I, I, I think it, it, this isn't just going to be a next two or three months. I think for the foreseeable future, it may be a year, 18 months or so, because people want to sort of almost get over the fear of a second pandemic in the autumn, winter, you know, where you possibly can work from home. 
you should work from home, quite frankly. And as I say, I think this sort of commute into central Manchester, central Leeds, central Edinburgh, Glasgow, London, we're going to have to rethink that quite dramatically. And I don't think people have actually got quite down to the nitty gritty yet of um, recognizing that as we start to sort of come out of the lockdown, we are going to have to fundamentally change the way people work for the foreseeable future. Oh, it's a huge issue, isn't it? Paul, can I bring you in on this one? If you're there. I'm here, yes. I've been listening with uh, incredibly interested, but absolutely fascinating. Uh, and everything that's been said so far is absolutely music to my ears. I, it really is. Um, it's nice to be amongst people that think similarly. Um, one of the things that has come out of this immediately is the uh, positive impact this is going to have on the environment, and we're already seeing that come through. And I think if we don't, as a as society, as a as species, if we don't take advantage of that and really um, drum it down, uh, it's going to be a huge missed opportunity that we may live to regret. Um, I think also um, the comments that, that Bob was making with regard to quality, I think is absolutely bang on the mark. And, and as an industry, I think that, that is precisely where we should be. Uh, the issues with overhead costs, I agree, the overhead costs uh, are, are going to be a major challenge. But within that, uh, the variable costs of staffing. And I think that the way we mitigate staffing costs is by uh, investing money in in the people that we employ with the industry, uh, we invest in paying them well, training them well, so we get more out of fewer individuals, uh, for want of a better word. Yeah, yep, I, 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 I think great comments there. I'll just make two points. If If you look at the sort of awful statistics from around the world, um, when the dust settles and they start to really look at the statistics, the appalling death rates really have occurred in those cities of extreme densities of population. Yep, whether it's Paris, London, New York, Sao Paulo, etc. Yeah, that should be a lesson to us that you know really intense, crowded places are where you have potentially more issues with a thing like COVID-19. And therefore, it is in all our interest to find ways of what I term not having those overcrowded cities and overcrowded places. And I think, therefore, more people working from home, less traveling to those central places, and that will help the environment as well. And I think the second point you make about investing more in people, absolutely, I think we've got to recognize, you know, we've got to invest in people, not just in buildings that we've pretended to be obsessed with in the past of obsessed, you know, more, you know, more spent on a, an upgrade of a restaurant or a new hotel with gold taps in the bathrooms and whatever, really focus on investing in the people. And I often relate to the example I had with the work I did with a restaurant group in London, which were, um, there were four Michelin starred Indian restaurants. And when the migration rules changed, we had to increase the minimum rate of pay for the chefs from 23,000 to 34,000 pounds a year to overcome the migration rules. And we employed 73 chefs. And we thought this would be ruinous to the business. When we actually did it, what it actually meant was, one, we selected the chefs with much greater care. Two, when they arrived, we looked after them with much greater care. Three, we found because they were highly trained chefs, they were very multifunctional and could multitask. And surprise, surprise, their productivity was enormously higher than the original workforce. And I think there's a, a moral in that lesson somewhere that by selecting better quality recruits, spending more time and giving them real attention on training and the right skills, productivity le levels do rise 
and out of that becomes a new business model. Oh, very interesting. David, Reeves, can I bring you in at this point? Yeah, I know, you, I know you have some points to make here. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, uh, this is a great discussion. There's just so many interesting threads in here. Um, as, as someone who runs a supply chain consultancy, um, I have a slightly different perspective to some of the things that's been said here. But the, the first would be, I, I see hospitality as being very much part of the agri-food sector. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not just about hospitality, we're about uh, delivering food on a plate to customers, which ultimately comes from a food supply chain. And I think it's quite telling that Bob's previous comments about being involved in regular meetings during the foot and mouth uh, incident is a really good example of how we sit in a supply chain which, or in a value chain, which is very, very critical. And right now, we're probably more exposed, as Bob was alluding to earlier, to uh, the risks around supply chain. But at the same time, I think your points about collaboration are absolutely on, on the money. And I think hospitality people are natural networkers. And I really, really like you know, Michael's comments about us just getting stuck in and problem solving. And, and, and Bob's comments about, you know, with uh, Ronald Reagan saying, well, just go and fix it. And there are so many good things going on right now that we've, we've become involved in. You know, for example, um, pushing, um, pushing and promoting the Pick for Britain campaign, because we're still, uh, we're still about 60,000 workers short for peak harvest, which is just coming up. Um, and there's, uh, there's, I, I don't know how many, uh, um, uh, but literally over a million hospitality workers on furlough. So there, there's a real opportunity to, to create cross-sector collaboration. Um, well, at, at the moment, I'm also talking to hoteliers who are saying, again, reflecting Bob's comments about, um, about that, that you know, hotels are going to be in a much more do not disturb world where people want to go and uh, get in their room and feel safe. And, and also uh, they'll, they'll want grab and go or packaged food rather than a dining experience. And we're working with uh, the, the airline caterers to help um, link them to, uh, to hotels so that box breakfasts and stuff like that can be really economic and, and so on, because all the airline caterers are now uh, short on capacity. And you know, there's, there's, there's just all sorts of stuff going on in the, in the supply chain. You know, people like um, break, uh, Bid Food and Breaks are now delivering product to retailers because they, they still haven't got the supply chain set up to deal with retail demand. That's all going to shift back the other way in the next three or four months. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that we are very good at collaborating. And what we need to do is just liberate ourselves to get stuck in and do that stuff all the more because I think as a sector, great strength. Can, can I just come in there and say I, I think you're really on the money there David. I, I recall during the foot and mouth I set up regular meetings with my counterpart from the NFU Food and Drink Federation and the Retail Consortium yeah. to see how collectively because we were actually all whilst we had our separate you know core business we actually you know had much more in common if i can put it in those terms and we uh, we worked actually pretty closely together we say with nfu and food and drink federation and retail consortium on a whole range of initiatives you know um, you know the obvious one with the nfu was sort of helping the you know sort of farmers particularly the sheep farmers and linking up with them but I, I do think now is the time for you know that leadership to be shown to tie up with those those bodies that are you know we 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 share a similar challenge, shall we say we can help each other and work together and and there are a lot of side benefits come out of that on a national basis and on a regional and local basis. There's some great questions coming through in the chat, uh, Marco. Can I bring you in at this point? Well, it's a very good question, which doesn't get touched on very much. Yes, Bob, um, where do you see the, the massive meetings and events industry? Of course, <laughs> large conference centres from the EICC yep. to the FCCC in, in Scotland and, of course, throughout the country. Yeah, I'm afraid in, in, in the short term, there may be a lot of empty white elephants uh, there, Mark, a little bit like football stadia. And... Um, <sighs> 
I, I, I actually think their challenge is no different to the challenge the rest of us ultimately about until you know confidence resumes for want of a better word, you know, you're not going to see the use of, the, you know, those big stadia, are we? And um, I haven't got a solution, I'm afraid, but I say I think they have a particular challenge. Uh, one is one cannot see a lot of what I term global travel in the short term. Uh, people are going to be reluctant even to go to local meetings. So as I say, I think the meetings industry um, Stadia caterers, for example, have got some even bigger problem, I think, than the pub, the pub and restaurant sector. I don't see a solution there until one general confidence starts to return. And quite frankly, we really do have to hope and pray that the, you know, the bright scientists around the world do come up with a vaccine. You know, I think that will be the ultimate solution for that. But I say I think the meetings industry the stadia businesses have got a real problem over the next 12 months. Uh, Vicky, I'm sorry, Mark, I, am, I, I, can't, I can't think that in the immediate future, people are going to feel keen on going to large meeting places. Vicky, can I bring you in at this point? Something yeah. very different. Vicky Latrobe. Yes, hello, Chris. Hi. So, um, oh, are you okay? Uh, yeah, fine. Thanks very much. Good. Yeah, my my point really was um, thinking more about uh, leading on from the discussions that there's been on uh, the points of public transport and actually moving people around. One of the questions I have is whether the government could possibly really step up what has been a, I would say, a half-hearted focus on decentralizing from our overly London-centric country. Um, when you look at a lot of other European countries, none of them quite, I won't say none, but an awful lot of them don't have the same absolute focus on one key city that we have on London. <clears throat> and um, I remember when I was working in Sheffield in the 1980s, after the impact of the pit closures and the steelworks and all of that, there was actually a development corporation developed there that had planning powers and had the ability to focus efforts in that area. And the government supported it by moving elements of its business up there. So certain parts of employment, certain parts of training were handled in Sheffield. And I do wonder whether there may not be now a real uh, time for the government to put some weight behind trying to get less people out of London and creating more regional hubs and not just necessarily around the biggest cities some of the ones might be centered around places where people live where there are better connections and whether that might be something that, that we ought to seriously consider now uh i think the theory of that is absolutely spot on and we really should be trying to focus on uh not having everything in a just a few big cities for one for a better word but uh I can hear down the track uh, what the uh, the uh, the environmentalists and some of the um, the rural lobby will say to developments outside the big cities. Uh, but I I really do think that we are going to have to think very hard about, you know, is it sensible and wise to have a policy where we seem to be having more and more people just working, you know, in Britain in three or four large conurbations. Um, one in the northwest, you know, uh, you know, Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, London, and you know, sort of uh, Sheffield, Leeds area. You know, there are lots of other places to develop. Whether it's Bristol, Southampton, you know, a whole range. We, I do think we we have to think hard about this sort of trying to transport millions of people into a few key places on a daily basis it isn't, is neither it, it just that. isn't very efficient or practical and maybe this will make us think hard about that in the future yeah, but isn't this the whole point really now this is a great discussion is will rural economies now take off in a way absolutely. they haven't done absolutely and I, and I don't from my perspective don't see that you need to focus on the major urban centers you don't have to necessarily destroy rural areas in order to provide people with the ability to work nearer to where they actually live. 
Um, well, the sheer fact that more people be working from home will perhaps help that. Yes. <laughs> I mean, my only question you on know, that one, my only question on that one is, are people fed up from working from home? I, I, I think there's I a combination. I, I always think you need a combination of the two, Chris. I, I think a lot of work can be done from home, but I never oh. underestimate the value of bringing people together from time to time. And I think it's going to be a combination of the two. I know there are two or three big city offices, um, investment, you know, where they've got six to 8,000 people in a block are looking at, you know, three days a week permanently working from home and two days coming into the office. I think we're going to see much more of that in the future where you have a combination of the two. You can do a lot of stuff online. You can work quite efficiently from home. But uh, as a corporate entity, there are occasions when you need to bring people together to get the power of people, as it were. Oh, I that. Can I just what? come in there um, just a second? I, I think you're absolutely right, Peter, I, and it, it's it's blatantly obvious. It, it's it's got to be the way forward, um, and there's all sorts of, of benefits that come out of that. Businesses, large corporate businesses, not needing to spend huge amounts of money on rent and rates in large uh, office blocks and what have you that could then be converted to. Um, being used for domestic accommodation instead of digging up greenfield sites to build houses. So massive <laughs> opportunities if we just think about it. So well, I know we had we had the experience in in what I term contract food services. You know with Gardner Merchant and with Compass. You know if you go back to the 70s and 80s, we both had something like 40 offices around the country with accommodation for probably 30 or 40 people in each office. And then over the years, you've developed far less offices, most people either hot desking or working from home and just going into an office point once a week. And, you know, that's the way Compass, Sodexo now and contract caterers have evolved and developed. And I see that on a much larger scale right across British industry that people can work from home. Uh, they need to go into a point maybe once or twice a week, but we won't need these enormous office blocks. I think they are going to become, some of them will become white elephants. Maybe they should be converted into uh, other, other, other buildings and for other use. David Wood, can I bring you this point? Ah, yes, indeed. Well, I've been agreeing with Bob nearly in everything that he says. Um, don't, David, I, don't say that. That upsets me. I know, I know. We spend so long arguing with one another from words. <laughs> but I, you, 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 you make absolute sense. I think that someone ought to, like, to find someone like you or you yourself to go back with a little bit more power to the DCMS. However, as of today's discussion, if I have one argument, and that is, what do I do with my B&B &B tomorrow? Um, you mentioned briefly about your COVID-approved um, initiative with a cleaning company, and it seems to me that some of this is key. There is actually, what do we need to do, or what does the dog and duck need to do tomorrow to try and help to open a business and earn a living? David, can I give you a quick answer? And I don't want to make a commercial here, but the company I've been working with, we've actually developed an opening pack for small businesses so that a small B&B &B or a small restaurant can order this pack of specialist cleaning equipment, okay, with a training guide to go with it on how it should be properly used in an intensive way. And attached to that will be a signage to actually be able to put on the door that you've actually cleaned your premises to this new standard with all the right equipment and people have been trained to do it. I think that is a practical, simple way we've got to work for the smaller business because the bigger business, the, the large giants will be able to sort of take care of it themselves, shall we say. You are correct and it's very good. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that a co commercial outfit doesn't cut it for me because um, they're a commercial outfit. What one 
I believe needs to be necessary is that we need to have some sort of certification, like a hygiene certificate that you have yeah. for operatives now. And that should be, um, that would give me more reassurance uh, to go and stay in a B and B or or, or um, a small hotel. But, but, I'm, but I'm David, we could we could we could adapt. Whether my pillow should be furloughed for seventy yeah. two hours or not, uh, uh, because um, I, I'm frightened of putting my head on somebody else's pillow. But but we could we could we could encourage the local authorities through the EHOs who currently have the role of inspecting premises to you know give them stars on you know that it's fit for purpose shall we say and they get sort of one to five stars you know use the whole EHO system across Britain to get involved in helping the industry uh, become what I term COVID approved yeah yeah okay. It's a reason. And I think it has to be, and we have to use the local authorities and the resource there uh, to help in that regard. Well, there we are. Go and get them to do it. Uh, Bob, go back to your old job and do it. <laughs> I sometimes get frustrated, David. I'd like you know, sort of, um, <laughs> you'd like to sort of get the minister and sort of tell him what he ought to be doing on a daily basis almost. I did write to you the other day and say, I thought you must be tearing your hair out. Well, well. On, that no on that note, we have to bring it to a close. I'm very conscious of time for everyone. Uh, can we just say thank a major thank you to Bob, please? It's been a fascinating session. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, and some great questions. Do have a read of the chat. There's been some great comments flying around the place. So there's no doubt, Bob, you've uh, raised a lot of thoughts in everyone's minds. So, well, can I just say, I think we've all got to stay optimistic. We, there, there will be an end game. And uh, all I know is that come what may, people always have to eat. They like to enjoy themselves and ultimately want to go out and have leisure time, etc. So hospitality will survive as an industry. It'll just be different. Yeah, I think it's true. Thank you very much. And thank you for everyone who's attended today. Okay. And I wish you a Take great day to everybody. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Chris. Chris. Thank you, and.